sir. We will uh, look about deployment patterns and capacity planning and if you have any questions uh, uh, feel free to interrupt and uh, ask. So I would assume uh, you would have some kind of WSO deployment experience uh, uh, and then you want to uh, understand more about how to plan your deployment and how to uh, size the, the initial uh, deployment. So deployment patterns is a pattern is a generally uh, reusable uh, solution to a common uh, recurring problem and most of the patterns uh, or almost all the patterns that uh, I, I will show you here are taken from production scenarios from uh, other customers and those incorporate the recommendations that we as WS2 tell customers uh, that, uh, these are the, uh, that these are the patterns that we recommend. So before going into patterns, uh, we'll look, look about the carbon framework. So I, I would assume most of you know what carbon is. So carbon is our core framework and it's uh, composed of these OHI bundles. So if you can see the, uh, the black set of uh, components uh, or boxes here, those represent the core framework. Uh, we call it as carbon core, which comprises of clustering, uh, logging, um, uh, caching, uh, uh, service management, and so on. And on top of the carbon core, we have uh, other set of uh, OHA components that implement product-specific functionality. For example, if you look at the ESB, uh, there should be components for message routing and uh, being able to transform messages uh, and so on. So those are Im implemented as uh, features on top of the carbon core framework. And when we bundle different products, uh, we basically get the carbon core and bundle all the features that's necessary or that's that will make an application server or that will make an ESB and uh, distribute that as a separate uh, product and then host it. But technically at uh, runtime uh, there is no limitation. You can uh, start from one uh, product and then add features uh, at runtime as you uh, go along. Uh, so first deployment pattern is uh, standalone so you, you do not uh, Configuration wise, there is no uh, clustering and so on. You are uh, starting products in standalone mode and using uh, uh, the, the products as a separate uh, servers. And the other one is shared runtimes. So this, uh, the black box you see outside is the, the JVM and inside that running JVM, we, we run multiple products. So multiple, we can install uh, features into a running carbon instance and sort of uh, extend uh, that functionality of a, a single uh, server. So typically, uh, e even though most of our customers do not use shared runtimes in production, but so in some instances uh, it makes sense to uh, use uh, shared runtimes. For example, if you have an application server that is not or that is very lightly used, then uh, we can incorporate other uh, products into the same uh, runtime to make uh, efficient use of the resources. So rest of the patterns, uh, so in introduction uh, to some of the symbols, uh, whenever you see this uh, icon, it, it represents any carbon based uh, product and icon uh, for a load balancer, uh, a database cluster and a, a cluster that is uh, has a load balancer in front of it. Uh, and here uh, we have the shared registry uh, pattern and the registry is shared using uh, JDBC. So when we have uh, multiple carbon products, uh, we can mount uh, the registry. So registry is like an embedded uh, uh, component we have which has three separate spaces. We call it as the local registry, config registry and governance registry. So typically in these registry spaces, uh, we would uh, store the instance specific uh, configurations into the local registry. And a config registry is typically shared between a cluster of uh, similar instances. For example, if you have an application server cluster, uh, those would share, uh, say, share the same uh, config registry. And for an ESB cluster, we would have a different uh, config registry and uh, uh, 
uh, share that across uh, those nodes. And uh, governance registry we would share among all the products uh, or all the nodes in the cluster so that anything you put into governance registry uh, can be accessible uh, from uh, any server. A typical uh, use case uh, for this would be uh, let us say you have an ESP deployment and you have a transformation uh, written using XSLT and we would typically host it in the governance registry. So, you can uh, refer to that uh, XSLT from uh, pretty much anywhere in the deployment. And in the registry pattern also here this uh, there are four patterns. So, local registry everything uh, config local and governance registry in is hosted uh, in a single uh, instance. And then we have a, a remote governance registry we have we are storing uh, local and config registries in uh, the node and remotely mounting uh, the governance registry. And then uh, we have the governance and uh, config registries mounted uh, remotely and here in, in, the, in the fourth pattern we have governance config uh, both uh, residing in separate uh, uh, registries. Uh, and also we support a WS based model for sharing this uh, registry, but uh, in typical production scenarios uh, web service based uh, mounting tends to be slower than the JDBC mounts. So, we would recommend uh, you not use a WS based uh, registry uh, in, in a production uh, scenario. So, clustering, so we uh, here clustering for uh, high availability. Uh, so, we have a load balancer and we have an active and a passive node. Uh, so, in order to do this uh, we support uh, carbon clustering you can configure uh, the carbon um, instance uh, support we ship Hazelcast as a, a clustering and a caching library. So, when you configure when you enable clustering configuration we are doing clustering based uh, on this Hazelcast uh, framework. When, when we configure the cluster we have uh, uh, three modes uh, we uh, you can configure the addressing scheme uh, as a multicasting. So, when you specify multicasting as an addressing scheme uh, you are able to discover the other nodes in the cluster uh, dynamically. And in order to do that uh, you need to have a multicast enabled uh, network. So, typical infrastructure as a service providers like for example, Amazon does not allow uh, multicasting in their network. So, we have to use uh, the next one a well known addressing uh, scheme that you have to specify the members in advance uh, who, uh, who will be uh, in your cluster. And also we provide this AWS mode uh, based clustering where cluster membership uh, is written to a S3 bucket. So, from there we uh, read that configuration uh, about members uh, and then uh, configure clustering. Or with without using carbon clustering you can uh, deploy isolated instances. So, there is no clustering uh, configuration involved you are solely relying on the load balancer to uh, uh, do active uh, passive uh, failover. And then you have to configure separately a synchronization mechanism between the active nodes and the passive node to synchronize uh, configurations. Uh, clustering for scalability. So, this is a, st a static clustering. So, we have a load balancer and then uh, uh, we have separate uh, set of uh, ca carbon instances. Uh, for this uh, we used to have a WS2 uh, elastic load balancer, but uh, we do not have uh, we sort of retired that elastic load balancer uh, and we are now relying on uh, external load balancers. Uh, you can use pretty much any uh, load balancer for this. Uh, clustering with a deployment synchronizer. So, depth sync uh, is typically mentioned as deployment synchronizer. Uh, in a cluster we have this uh, worker manager separation concept. Uh, you can have a manager node or the admin node which will deploy all the uh, artifacts and through deployment synchronizer it will uh, synchronize uh, these artifacts across all the uh, worker nodes. So, when, when we consider about live traffic only the worker nodes will uh, serve live traffic uh, admin in, admin node will not involve with uh, serving uh, live traffic. So, we can separate uh, separate out the admin part and the the, the uh, sort of the heavy lifting of uh, 
serving uh, requests there. Uh, the deployment synchronizer we currently support uh, SVN based uh, depth sync, so you have to have a SVN server running and then uh, configure all these nodes uh, to point to uh, SVN server. We also uh, uh, tried uh, to use uh, Git for this, but Git has a slight uh, different model where when we have the multi-tenancy uh, mode, we have to have a uh, we have to have 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 to have a, e, a separate repository per a tenant. So if you have like 100 tenants, then you will end up with 100 different uh, uh, Git repository. So it's not uh, manageable. Uh, so deep, when you are uh, coming up with the deployment architecture, some things to note, uh, whether you are deploying this to physical machine, uh, virtual machines, or a cloud-based uh, deployment model, or do you want to uh, have a hybrid model uh, to do cloud bursting. And you need to uh, aware about, or you need to take into account the infrastructure policies that you already have, uh, and design your deployment uh, accordingly. And also non-functional -function, requirements are very important. What are the uh, characteristics and uh, SLAs that uh, you, are, you are going to provide uh, with the deployment to the business uh, users? Uh, and also the simplicity. So we always recommend uh, customers to uh, uh, basically use the simplest possible deployment and then uh, use uh, an uh, iterative approach or use a measured approach to scale your deployment. So not to deploy like 50 instance instances beforehand, but uh, start with one or two and uh, test out, uh, identify the characteristics of the deployment, identify the performance of the existing environment and uh, scale from there onwards. So it's a, it's a much more effective way that way then you get a chance to see and uh, find out the characteristics of your deployment. So uh, performance characteristics vary on uh, multiple uh, sina multiple uh, factors. So may there may be uh, uh, network level uh, issues that you have in your data center or network level latencies. Uh, so it, it depends on the scenario and the, the other uh, infrastructure uh, issues that uh, issues or like limitations or uh, you might have. And then you need to have some governance uh, policies uh, uh, to govern what's, what's going to be deployed, how you are going to be deployed, uh, and so on. And also change control when you have to make a change or when you have to do a deployment change or adding new node or altering the deployment, you have to have a proper change management uh, process involved. So let's uh, go th uh, through some of the reference architectures uh, taken from uh, production scenarios. Here uh, we have uh, two data centers. Uh, these two data centers was residing in multiple uh, geographically uh, different locations. And uh, in one data center we have, uh, you can see, uh, so these uh, layers, uh, logical cluster shopping, uh, cluster trading. So these reside on multiple uh, levels, levels of uh, hardware load balancers and then multiple levels of uh, ESBs. And they basically load balance uh, to hundreds of service instances uh, hosted on uh, Tomcat. So basically or mainly uh, only doing uh, header based uh, routing uh, in this uh, deployment. Uh, so in the next architecture, we have uh, API manager. Uh, so API manager providing uh, API, uh, exposing API to uh, users. And here we have, uh, so this part, uh, this uh, virtual machine uh, is active and this uh, virtual machine is uh, acting as a passive uh, node that uh, sort of replicate the exact uh, deployment uh, we have in the, the active uh, node. So API gateway and then uh, authentication key manager is uh, acting as a separate instance and all the uh, message level uh, routing and uh, transformations uh, offloaded to an ESB. So this is again a best practice that uh, we tell customers uh, to adapt when you are using API manager, use API manager just uh, for a way of uh, exposing APIs uh, in a controlled uh, 
controlled way and uh, do all the heavy lifting of uh, message transformation and mediation uh, on a separate uh, ESB uh, layer. Uh, so, in this uh, architecture uh, there are, so this box, uh, the, the red line uh, you see uh, separates uh, external and internal users, uh, internal users uh, are users coming uh, uh, through the internal network. Uh, so, here you can see the exact uh, deployment uh, is there, uh, only difference is uh, there is a gadget server providing uh, more uh, dashboards to internal uh, users. And public users are coming uh, through uh, web app sourced on the application server and there is a mobile gateway uh, and ESB is used as a mobile gateway and here this deployment was done before we introduced uh, API manager. So, that is why you see ESB as used as an API gateway uh, in this deployment. And then we have an external services gateway that does the bridging uh, to uh, uh, internal uh, uh, service gateway and we have an internal service gateway here similarly uh, bridging uh, uh, to the external uh, users. And uh, internal users uh, basically use more uh, applications compared to applications exposed for uh, external uh, users. And we have our governance uh, identity and business activity monitor uh, sort of cross cutting between uh, external and internal uh, uh, users. Uh, so, in this deployment, uh, we have again uh, 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 external uh, and internal uh, uh, sort of uh, separation. Here through a load balancer, we uh, uh, expose store, uh, there are two uh, API manager stores and uh, two uh, gateways. Uh, so, you can scale gateways, uh, uh, gateways are uh, basically deployed to auto scale. So, you can go to n number of uh, nodes on the gateway uh, and internally they talk to uh, auth key manager. So, key manager is inside uh, the network and uh, in this deployment the publish is also internal. So, you are only exposing store uh, to users. So, users are not able to publish. So, only internal users can publish and then uh, external users can uh, consume that. And in this deployment, we have uh, BAM. Uh, so, we will be uh, replacing uh, this with uh, DAS, uh, which will have a slightly different uh, deployment uh, model. Uh, so, here in this case, uh, an organization had three different uh, business uh, units of three different uh, financial uh, uh, sections uh, that uh, when we, uh, when a request comes, depending on the, the request data, uh, the request is routed to the correct uh, business uh, uh, request is given to the correct uh, business uh, uh, unit that handle that particular uh, or that has that uh, API uh, capability. Uh, so, capacity planning, uh, so you, uh, basically planning uh, for scaling and uh, having the right uh, size of the deployment. So, in order to have uh, an idea about this and e or in order to scale uh, in a, in a uh, constructive manner, you need to monitor system and gather uh, some data about your deployment and maybe uh, from business or existing uh, statistics uh, that you or how many users are using the system, or how many requests are currently uh, handling, uh, handled by the system uh, and so on. And you need you need an idea about uh, what would be your projected uh, traffic is uh, going to be. Uh, and so this is a, a metric that uh, we put uh, uh, high uh, effort on, uh, high weight on. So expected maximum uh, throughput and expected uh, latency. So those two are, are very important. And uh, size of the messages that uh, your deployment uh, is uh, handling and also work done per transaction. So, when we mean work done, it can be uh, how CPU consume, consuming or uh, <laughs> memory consume, con 
consuming uh, that application is. And also you need to know the maximum uh, transactions per second or transactions per minute. A transaction per day is not that use, useful because um, that your peak transactions might happen uh, within a short period of time uh, it maybe happen during the morning or uh, night in a very short period of time. So if you do not know the exact number uh, we uh, recommend uh, you to sort of uh, get an idea like whether it is tens, uh, hundreds uh, or uh, thousands. And size of messages uh, it is better to uh, classify them as uh, small, medium, large, uh, extra large. So here in this deployment uh, we have classified it like a small is 50k and extra large is greater than 5 MB. So this is not a hard and fast rule. So in your deployment extra large might be uh, maybe 1 or 2 gigabytes. So we have seen uh, deployments uh, like that. So if uh, anytime if you are dealing with messages larger than 1 MB, we recommend you to do a performance test on your deployment, uh, uh, on your actual deployment to identify how the system is uh, performing. Because for large messages, uh, performance characteristics uh, vary uh, widely. Uh, so, example for API manager, if you are thinking about uh, API, uh, so this is a distributed uh, API manager deployment. So, API gateway uh, peak load of API calls, uh, same uh, peak load of uh, API calls for the auth server and peak load of subscriptions and browsing uh, for store, uh, publisher uh, peak load of uh, how many users will be publishing uh, API uh, APIs and again analytics uh, uh, what are what will be the number of load that will be coming to the analytic uh, server. So I have used tier here, so tier represent uh, the physical uh, 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 tier that you will have and we will tip, uh, you usually uh, say uh, a layer to represent uh, uh, a layer in the logical architecture. Uh, and uh, it is best to uh, consult uh, available performance number. So this is uh, taken from uh, this link, you can go to this link ESB uh, performance round 7.5. Uh, so it is best to uh, get performance numbers, uh, existing performance numbers uh, uh, for a product. We do not have uh, or we have not published uh, performance numbers for all of our products publicly. Uh, we uh, we ha we do have published uh, statistics for e ESB. Uh, others we uh, try to do uh, on on a case by uh, case uh, basis. And you need to apply that uh, the same uh, policy for each uh, tier and uh, size your uh, deployment. So then you need to compute the number of instances that you would need. So this uh, e this is basically. Uh, counting instances for uh, API manager uh, minimum uh, distributed deployment with high availability. Uh, so in order to have uh, high availability with minimum number of instances we need at least uh, 5 instances, uh, 2 gateways, uh, 2 key managers and 1 for store and uh, publisher. So if we incorporate uh, DAS uh, to do analytics then we need uh, minimum deployment, we need uh, 2 DAS uh, nodes. So altogether 7 API manager 5 plus uh, 2 DAS, in, DAS instances. Uh, so minimum number uh, for distributed uh, uh, deployment with external store, then uh, we have an additional node that is uh, se separate handling for store and one uh, publisher node. And for uh, DAS uh, fully distributed uh, high, with high availability we need uh, 6 API manager and then uh, two receivers, two indexers, uh, two spark uh, nodes and two dashboards on all together two, six, uh, eight nodes for dash uh, in the distributed uh, high available uh, deployment. So again this uh, you need to do for each uh, tier as well in your deployment. Uh, so again this is based on your actual, it should be based on your actual use case. And every use case we have seen uh, has different uh, performance uh, characteristics and also uh, message sizes. Uh, so, 
some tools that uh, we use uh, typically to get these numbers, uh, JMeter, uh, SOAP UI and uh, load UI when you are doing uh, performance uh, tests. So it's advisable if you can work with uh, the WS2 consultant to fill uh, the capacity planning uh, sizing uh, document. Uh, we have a document that uh, we are sending to customers uh, to get their feedback on what's the maximum average and minimum uh, uh, message uh, sizes and uh, throughput. Uh, things to consider when you are doing capacity planning, it's best to keep a 30% buffer. So uh, we have found out that this uh, works uh, well uh, in number of uh, other deployments when you have a 30% buffer uh, for capacity and allocate uh, 2 GB maximum heap size per JVM. So this again will change with the new microservices uh, server. Uh, so this is written for the uh, old uh, set of servers that we have. And best to keep uh, 2 GB of minimum for uh, operating system. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you run out of memory, then uh, you will uh, encounter situations where your process gets killed automatically and uh, you need to find out that. Uh, so we have uh, experience where instance uh, sort of disappears and uh, when you find out the, the ohm killer in Linux has uh, killed the Java process because it's consuming so much of memory. So uh, you need to keep uh, that in mind as well. And use uh, system load for uh, gathering data like uh, memory usage and also disk usage. Uh, if you're logging a lot of um, stuff in your applications, then you need to be aware of uh, the log growth as well. So the log files can grow um, uh, rapidly. And then you need to configure the log rolling mechanism uh, if you are having that kind of rapid uh, log growth. And it's best to keep a performance testing uh, and long run testing as part of your user acceptance uh, test. And uh, I know at least uh, uh, two customers who use this. Uh, if the performance test does not pass, uh, they don't go into uh, uh, UAT and that release is not uh, promoted to uh, production. Uh, hardening the extended uh, existing uh, deployment. Uh, so we can use a secure vault. Secure vault is a way to secure passwords, a plain text password in configuration files in uh, production uh, systems. So this we, um, uh, must use for all the production uh, instances uh, to avoid. Uh, so we, if you look at uh, uh, con configurations file we have right now, like the registry XML, user management XML, we, uh, you, you need to specify a lot of passwords uh, to connect to LDAP, connect to a database, and so on. So through Secure World, we can encrypt uh, those uh, passwords. And in a cluster deployment, we can scale through uh, headless uh, workers. Uh, and also connect to uh, existing uh, LDAP AD if you have uh, those inside your enterprise. And before uh, deploying into production, it's again very important uh, to do uh, OS level and JVM level uh, tuning. Uh, we, in the product documentations, we have mentioned some uh, best practices that uh, we have found uh, that increases uh, maximum file size, file max of the system, uh, uh, and, and so on. So, that's about it I have.